Well, welcome back to a, Along the Road here in Kingston, New Hampshire. We're at the First Congregational Church. I'm Pastor Josh. And I am Katie Johnson, the Children's Discipleship Director. And we have a lot of fun here every week just talking about our faith, uh, how it interacts with us, how we live it out. Uh, recently, along with our church, we've been unfolding our, our book read. Um, I was telling a group earlier today that I we do a book read most winters. And so this is, yeah, Political Gospel... <laughs> Political Gospel, Public Witness in a Politically Crazy World by Patrick Shiner. This is what we've been going through, and we're hitting more the middle of the book this week. And we've learned things about what he calls the way of the kingdom, the way of the dove. We've learned that all of us have a politic, uh, or we are all political. Whether you want to or not, saying you're not political is a political statement. And so, uh, as, as I was sharing this morning, even the idea because we were talking a little bit about how communion and people saw it differently and, and they were, our eyes were open. It's a, it's a, a, a unifying thing. Mm. Even communion is a political statement. You're saying in communion, I believe the kingdom of God is above all. And, and that is a political statement. That means it's above your own American government or, or kingdom, wherever you are. Um, and it is a political statement. We, we think of... of Politics is only having to do with democracy. Right, right. But it doesn't. Or voting and, and the, right. the laws of the land. But politics is everything. It's how we are, arrange our lives, uh, how we assemble and what we do together. It's government. It, it is. It's, it's a governing of self uh, and, and mm-hmm. others. So that idea was interesting. And I remember even at the table this morning, they said, someone had said, because I'd seen it always as personal, and then I realized it's not, you know, communion. And, you know, we chimed in and said, well, that's a political statement we make. We don't feel it, I think, here in the U.S. because when we do communion, some people do it out of just a ritual, right? Mm-hmm. Some people do it every week, and it's become normal. Some people do it once a month, and, and there's all different ways to do it. But you never do it wondering, is the government going to knock my door down because I'm doing communion, because we are saying that we are believers, and we believe that the kingdom of Christ is more than our American government. They don't care if you believe that here, here in the U.S. They don't care if you believe that, but... Um, yeah, it's there are places there that are do places, care. There are places that do care. Uh, so it's definitely a political statement. Um, we said, uh, I, I said that people in uh, Ukraine, when they choose to follow the Lord, you're you're rejecting the society around you, and some of them lose their jobs. Some of them won't get a job because of that. Or they're, uh, I know a lot of students that we worked with in Ukraine were ridiculed in in university situation because they believed. And went to a church that believed in Christ as Savior. That's a different kingdom, and it's a definitely a political statement to them that affects everything in their life. Sure, we don't see it as much because publicly a pastor of a church, and it doesn't affect everything in my life. And most people in our congregation, it doesn't affect everything in their life. Um, they just are told, "Oh, you go to church, oh, okay," and they move on. Uh, so this is an interesting thing that we are making a political statement of this. Are gathering on Sundays it should be a, in in the sense of this term, a political statement. Every time we gather, I believe that Christ's kingdom is greater than the American kingdom, or wherever you're from, kingdom. Right. <laughs> you know <laughs> that type of thing. So we're in chapter four, um, and we're we're moving on from there. And chapter four begins to talk about the two things that that he he has in tension in life: subversion subverting the government, subverting these things, and that happens uh, everywhere, even here. And, and, and then the other opposite side, which we'll get to in Chapter 5, is submission. Mm-hmm. So this this week will be mostly about that subversion topic. And he talks about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. That's how he opens the chapter. Yeah. And I, I knew most of the story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a, a pastor in Germany mm-hmm. during World War II, and uh, began to write against... Hitler, and there were other pastors that felt like like he did, but he he, and I, I've read that in his journals you can find these areas where he contemplated what he was doing and whether it was right or, or not. It was an arduous was choice. Out. Yeah, it was an arduous yeah. choice for him uh, because you can write yeah. you can write against your government, you can speak against, but he he went a step further in joining a group of people that had a conspiracy against him to to assassinate Hitler, and they were nearly successful. Yeah. Um, and I forgot about that part until I read this. Is like that how close to being successful they were, um, and 
the interesting part about subversion, that's, that's what he was. Like, he was subverting the government. Um, actively. Actively yeah. subverting the government. And what he, what he did, both him and any other ones like him, is they also did that, but they understood if they went to prison, that was part of the game. Mm-hmm. You know, you accept the responsibility of your subversion, you know, and what he was doing. And that ties in a little bit to the submission piece. Yes. Yeah, that, that'll come back into the submission piece yeah. again. Yeah. But the idea was he he offered and was with the group and tried to assassinate uh, the known president or dictator at the time. Right, and ended up paying with his life. And he did pay with his life at, uh, near the end of the war. Uh, yeah, he, two weeks. Can you imagine? I'm pretty sure they didn't want him to get loose. So yeah. I'm pretty sure about that. So it's interesting, he says, when the story of the church, the political present, um, and the political nature of our faith remains... The subversive nature of the gospel comes out into focus as Paul goes into various cities and towns. Mm. Uh, Bonhoeffer is this way, but as Paul goes into various cities and towns, um, and you see it when Jesus, while Jesus ministers mainly in rural areas, Mm -hmm. Paul voyaged into urban centers, and then he consequently bumps up against these authorities. Sure. You find it in in Ephesus and in Philippi. He's in prison in Philippi. In Ephesus, there's a riot, and... And Thessalonica, they run Thessalonica, him out of town. They run him out of town. He's still like all these different things. And he is not always directly speaking against the government. What he's speaking is the kingdom of God, which is directly against the government. Right. But he never says, you shouldn't. you shouldn't do this, right. you know. Right. So we're going to look here as to how the early church subverts the empire. Uh, so this is history uh, back in where it was. It says, after Jesus died, how did the empire view the Christian message? How did Rome see this? Um, was Rome content to let it be uh, an upstart movement, let, let it live in peace? Did they view the message as a challenge to their authority, their way of life? Or did they consider this as just a little blip on the radar? It's like not a big deal. So the book of Acts gives us like this early glimpse. So you would behoove you at this point to start reading through Acts getting into the center chapters of Acts to do that. It says, yeah. Rome receives this message. One thing is clear. It was not viewed as a private message they could ignore. Which is interesting. They are not speaking out there picketing against Rome. That's They're right. just proclaiming the kingdom of God. Right. And so Rome said we can't ignore this. And it was not regarded as supporting the Caesar the Caesar's sovereignty. So they said what you're doing doesn't support the sovereignty of our Caesar who is Lord, as they say, Caesar is Lord. Mm -hmm. Instead, what they were doing as believers is this is another way. Mm -hmm. This is the way of Christ, the the way of those who follow Christ, who is Messiah, who is King, who is Lord. And um, and so it's a disruption. He puts at the bottom of 82. It's a disruption and a political challenge to Caesar himself. All that just by claiming Christ as Lord. And Rome saw that. So that's why we mentioned the, the different parts in Acts and where Paul went. And it was not seen as, oh, we don't have to worry about those little people who follow the way thing. Um, Paul's political message. I like how he puts it in 83. Paul's political message, not gospel message. They're the same. <laughs> right. They are the same. His political message is that Christ is king. Christ is Lord. But Paul's political message destabilized the Roman world. And over time, it does do that. And if you think about it, yeah. here's one man, Paul, yeah. talking about Jesus is Lord, and you've got this enormous Roman Empire. Right. I mean, it stretches as it centered in, in Italy, but it stretches as far as Great Britain mm-hmm. and, and down, out, out, out to the east and out yeah. through the Mediterranean and the Aegean. Yeah. And I think we forget the yeah. power that was behind Paul's message. It was very powerful. Yeah. And, and without an army. That's right. With, with, without, without killing anyone. Without lifting a sword. Without lifting a sword. Uh, it's the, the power of, of being free and living in a kingdom that's not of this world. Uh, and people yearn for it. I think today they still yearn for it. Sure. Um, so he talks about Thessalonica like you did. Mm-hmm on page 83, and he uses the word subvert, and he goes, the, Patrick, the author, says, you know, why do I stick to this word? You oh, know, right. uh, and, and out of Acts 17, you see what happened here, and he says that they accuse Paul of two things. 
mm-hmm. turning the world upside down mm-hmm. and defying the, the decrees of Caesar. And so first they said, um, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So this is, they're talking about Paul and his people. And it says he loves the idea that the gospel message turns the world upside down. And there are books written about that, uh, the upside down kingdom. Uh, with some men this morning that we're talking about the upside down kingdom coming out in the Sermon on the Mountain. How it like, mm-hmm. turns the kingdom of God is everything upside down. It's very yeah. interesting. Um, so it fits great with this idea that it's not just a political message, but it's definitely subversive to the kingdom that at the time is Rome. Yeah. Um, yeah. The word... And it actually... Well, so I was intrigued by that phrase, turning the world upside down. Right. Which is the... Engl- no, English the name? ESV? Yeah. ESV. Yeah. So I looked up what the NIV was, yeah. and that was causing trouble all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, tra- the translations can be a little different, you know, but it's still... But shows I like the same idea. Bo- yes, it does. And I like yeah. having both because it makes the yeah. understanding richer. Exactly. So the word for turning upside down or mm-hmm. causing trouble over the world can be translated differently. He says it there at the bottom. And the Greek term initially means initially means to subvert, to agitate, to overthrow, to disturb. And I think that's why he sticks to the word subvert. Yes. You know, uh, it turns the world upside down. It, it, it just, and we need that. I think we need that in our personal lives, too. When our world is turned upside down, we recognize, I am not God. I am not the one that's centered in the world, but that's how we live. I know? am not in control. <laughs> my good is the good that needs. My right is the right that's right. It's very different, you know. Um, so Paul, in his text, says that he subverts, that they say that he has subverted not just Thessalonica, the world, right, with his message. Right. Uh, so the whole earth is, is kind of a part of the translation can also be translated as in the Roman Empire. Mm. So so depending on how you see it or how they would have expressed it, mm-hmm. you know, their world was the Roman Empire. The known world, yeah, that's right. And you right. have thrown this upside down. So they're accused of subverting the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. I think in some ways, you know, we could be accused of subverting our government because we trust in Christ. We trust in them and not in our government. Yeah. It just doesn't come out as viciously in that sense uh, because our government, our democracy is different than Rome was. Right. Um, The second charge Paul's group receives is they were acting contrary to Caesar's decree because they're saying that Jesus is king, which is something very different. Right. Um, With a statement like this, it's difficult to deny that there's a political nature to to what they're saying. Remember in Rome, everywhere you go, Caesar is Lord. Yep. And the confession of the church is Christ is Lord. You know? And that that's a that's a major thing to have. Right. And it's right, right up against it. I mean I, I'm trying to figure out what that would sound like here in the United States. You know. <laughs> we say Christ is Lord and we're not like, oh, okay, yeah. We vote different presidents in all the time and that's okay. You know, but it's so that's a little different for us in that feeling of what rules, you know. Sometimes I think I touch on it. Football is Lord. Football is Lord. <laughs> well, I touch on it. I think sometimes when I say, you know, who knows? In 200 years, America may not even be here. United States might not even be here. Right. We have to understand. Look at the Greeks, the Romans. You know, is there remnants left? Sure, but it's not what it once was. Oh, not even close. And so saying that the kingdom of God will outlast the kingdom of whoever's the ruling power right now. You can say America, China. Uh, Great Britain, like whatever the, the major powers are right now, the kingdom of God will outlast each one of them. Yeah. Uh, is almost like saying Caesar's not Lord. Na, 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 na. Yeah, it's not <laughs> happening. It doesn't go there. So it, 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 he says it's important to point out this that those in Thessalonica interpreted the kings, the, the claim that Jesus is king, as contrary to the claim of Caesar as king. Mm-hmm. They saw him as being up against what they believed. Not believe, but what they believe politically, and they believe the way their world was organized. Mm -hmm. So in a church, when we say Christ is Lord, he is in control, we are up against even our own democracy. You know, I don't, I I participate in my democracy, I don't have faith in my democracy. Right. And there is a difference. There is a difference. But you can miss it if you're not careful. I think you can, because we, we have faith that... Especially if the vote goes away, we wanted it to go. Mm-hmm. We have faith it's going to be okay. Right. But we should have faith either way. Mm-hmm. And that is what is up, up against our, our current type of political aspect. Mm-hmm. So he calls 
agitator in Philippi, Jerusalem. This is what, what he did. In other towns, Paul does this. He's in jail. He's an agitator. Um, and it, it's very hard to conclude that that what Paul does is anything other than, well, one, speaking the kingdom, but then going up against, he says, disrupting the fabric of Roman society. And he does that yeah. very clearly. He does and, that. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been painted as, as not a mere religious prophet, but a political agitator. That's what happens. If you read Acts later on in Acts 24, you know, and he's before Felix or he's before uh, these different leaders, they, they're, they, they're, he's before them as a political agitator. Mm. In Corinth, he's accused of persuading people to worship God, contrary to the law. In Ephesus, he disrupts the, the economy. His message uh, that Jesus is rightful king was agitating the entire empire. It's not private, and that's a big deal. We, I think that's one of our biggest faults here right now, at mm-hmm. least in our area, is that your faith is your faith. It's private. Mm-hmm. But the Christian faith is not a private faith. It's a very public faith. It's not a message that people can ignore. The Paul's gospel, like that of his master and Lord, was a political message. That's something that he says here. Mm-hmm. Um, so he has a chart, and you're welcome to go look at the chart about every city, every accusation, the accusers, and the verses that you can find that. And it'd be fun to go and read that and see that that his speaking the gospel is a political statement, and that's how it's received. And and he, he finds it that way in the, in the community they have. So he says that they, they come together. That's their political community. And I call it the like how the modern church looks. He says here in, in 88, the relational turn has conquered in the evangelical church. The grassroots fellowship movement has won. And much of this is good. And we want our communities to feel organic, authentic, relational and not stuffy, official and not authoritative. And that's true. That's, that's the way our, especially modern American church feels. Yes. And that's a really big, we don't want to feel stuffy. We don't want to feel this. We want to feel like we have organic relationships and we can grow in these things. But, he says, maybe we've overemphasized the relational portion. Mm-hmm. Maybe our political dis- discipleship is malformed and we don't think of church as a political assembly. And I, I wouldn't say maybe. I would say I know that very few of anybody in our church or any church I've ever been in thinks I'm coming to a political gathering. Right. Political rally. A political <laughs> rally. And that's what we, in, in essence, claiming Christ is King, every time we gather, it's a political rally. Mm-hmm. We're rallying for our King. Mm-hmm. You know, if you change the word to president, you would understand. Right. You know, but when I think president, like I had the power to put him in place because we voted, right? So right. I don't think that for Christ. I don't use that that's word. That's probably, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't use that word for him. So at its core, our gathering is a political assembly. Mm-hmm. He uses the word um, ecclesia, the Greek word of the uh, the local assemblies devoted to Jesus. Um, and then he has the quote that you love, you mentioned just a moment ago on page 88. <laughs> the Greek word for church is ecclesia and refers to an institutional entity. And that's all our gatherings. There are a lot of gatherings out there that are not Christ-believing, but they could be called ecclesias. They're institutional gatherings. But... He talks about Paul. He says, Paul was not willing to be thrown in prison so people could have organic relationships and sip white chocolate mochas together. And I feel like that's a lot of the way our faith is. Let's get together for coffee. I'm drinking my coffee right now. Like, Let's get together for coffee. Let's hang out. Go to the coffee. A lot of coffee shop faith. Be cool. They do this thing. But he was on mission instead to form a new body politic. Mm-hmm. If you thought of your coffee gatherings as um, political strategy gatherings, <laughs> I think it would change things. It would, unless you worked for um, varsity, uh, intervarsity, intervarsity, or Young Life, or something, and then your gatherings would feel a lot more like yeah. that because that's what they do. But the the ordinary church. The ordinary, so church, the ordinary church people who aren't working in a parachurch or aren't gathering to, to plan their ministries, mm-hmm. you know, think of your coffee gathering as political strategy gathering. And not just like, I'm going to meet with um, someone from church. Like, I, I can think that. But what about meeting with a non believer? And what you're trying to do is convince them to be part of your poli- political party, which is the party of the kingdom of Christ. Mm-hmm. That they, they have to do nothing to earn or be a part of other than accept Christ as king. Right. 
you know, we meet with people to try and convince them to to take the sale that we're selling. We meet with people to try and convince them to to vote a certain way or, or argue over something. Mm-hmm. You know. mm-hmm. But how often do we sit down with coffee and go, this is a political strategy gathering? I've never done that. Right. I've, I've never. <laughs> it's very interesting, you know, that the church is a political assembly. For hundreds of years, he says, before the birth of the Christian church, ecclesia was understood as a political term. We've changed that understanding. Huh, drastically. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so he, he breaks down the word ek from the, the means out of, and the verb kaleo means to call. So the ecclesia of a city would meet regularly and make decisions about law, official positions, and policy. And so that would the ecclesia of the city would be maybe our town hall gathering. Sure. You know, uh, in Athens, decisions were made by show of hands or ballots and sheets. So, so we I think recapturing the original intent of the word. Mm-hmm. And yes, the church is an ecclesia, but to understand that uh, we are making a statement. And uh, maybe we should transform it sometimes and say this is our political rally, and our political strategy meetings, and what we're doing. Uh, he says here in 89, we even have evidence in the, early, in the second century that Rome viewed the church's gatherings as political gatherings. Uh, Governor Pliny writes to the Emperor Trajan requesting advice on what to do with the Christians. He complains about them, saying he, even, he has even forbidden political associations and Trajan viewed the church also as a political assembly. So this isn't just Patrick coming up with this thing. The, the Romans viewed the church gathering as a political assembly. There is also the theological reality. The church is a political assembly because it's ruled by the ascended Christ. And that's what I keep coming back to. Mm-hmm. You know, That is my political rallying point. That, that is where, where I'm at. Yep. So. Yeah, we just... It's just, it's going to take us a while to yeah. reorient that way because it is not the way we're used to thinking. No, it's not. We're used to thinking organic relationships. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he says, therefore, the church answers first and foremost to the voice of Christ. That's And that's true. We say that. I think most people who are believers say, yes, Christ first, Christ first. But do you then realize that every time we gather, we are we are rallying for our political king? The statement that we're making. Right. This is why, I mean, now go back to Philippians 3.20, as he says on page 90. And it says, where Paul says to the Philippians, your citizenship is in heaven. Mm. They were Roman citizens or or citizens of a country that was ruled by Rome, but they were citizens. But it, Paul says not anymore. I carry a U.S. passport, but that's my citizenship is in heaven. You know, and, and that is so different now because are you a Roman citizen? I'm a citizen of Christ the King. Well, that's a different politic. That's a different Lord, you know. Um, Jesus, Jesus's citizens reinforce their identity by meeting together. That's mm-hmm. that rallying point. Mm-hmm. Worship itself, our songs of worship, it's a political statement. Isn't that amazing? I read that and I went, "Wow!" Yeah, worship that is itself. Not what I think of when I think of worship. No, you know. I mean, we've been singing uh, the last couple weeks uh, as we're coming into to this time and we're going through Revelation. Ruthie pulled out the song, Behold Our God. Mm-hmm. Behold Our God, seated on the throne. You know, we are crying the out. The language is there. Who is the king? It's, 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 the book just shifts your perspective to something that's already there. Right. Um, right. We have a, churches, we have a law and a code. Call that the scriptures. The Bible is the rule of law given to us by its monarch. That's Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, to his subjects, that's anyone who follows Jesus. Um, yes, I believe all. I just would have never used those words, but now, right. now that we're in this season, we understand that. Um, he says there's political sacraments, mm-hmm. and we have those. But uh, it's not. It, uh, some people find it odd that we have sacrament baptism and communion. There's these things, but he he first points out that everyone has them. Which is yeah, that was very interesting. Sports teams have jerseys. Banners, chants, songs. I mean, you, you can go to sports stadiums, whether it's football or baseball or basketball, and they have chants that they do and fight things songs. They do, fight songs that they do. Yeah. That, you know, that's a sacrament. They wear the right colors and they do the right things. Um, and, and so that's part of it. Armies, of course, all have different flags, which army you are part of. Uniforms, they, they, they have marching melodies and gatherings. Um, uh, I used to be part of Civil Air Patrol. And we'd march around, you know, teenage boys mar- marching around. But, like, you had the call and response as you're marching. You know, mm-hmm. these marching calls. 
and you know it, it told a story or told you how to behave or did something you know but it, it's what it was reinforced yeah. what you were doing as america we have sacred days mm-hmm. we don't do passover as america but we have july 4th we have labor day we have memorial day we set everything aside to remember who we are to remember what we stand for, mm-hmm. our democracy, our freedoms, our, you know, and who, who fought in them and how the lives are lost. So I think if you were to speak to a non-believer and draw that out, then you could say in the same way the church has rituals. Mm-hmm. In gatherings, we have two specific ones. One is uh, they're called sacraments or ordinances. People use different words. Uh, and Jesus in- instituted two signs that mark this community. One is baptism. Mm-hmm. Baptism marks us. It doesn't save us, but it, it's a sim- It's a public, once again, public symbol Statement. of something that I've done that represents my death to this world and my rising to the new king who's risen before me, Christ. You know that is a very political statement. That is that is a person uh, to take what's happening around America. Today. That's a, a person slapping on a big red MAGA hat, you know. But instead, it's I'm baptized. Mm-hmm. Christ is king hat. You know, um, and so that that's one. And then the other sacrament is the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper uh, shows us and reminds us who king, who the King is. He says so in, in in the last scene there when he's in the upper room, and we remind each other every in our church every month. Do this in remembrance. Of Do me. this in remembrance of me. Understand what this is. I am King, and remember, even the Israelites, you trust me to be over the Pharaoh who says he is God Himself. Mm-hmm. That's a political statement. Participating in the first Passover is also a political statement. It's a statement that I have faith in God versus God. Which mm-hmm. one? Well, there's the Pharaoh God who's just a human being, or there's the God, the creator. And they, they chose who they have faith. So it, it is a political statement in, in what it is. Um, he says the term sacrament is not found in the New Testament. We don't use that term. It's a, a Latin origin word. So it would have come later. And Jerome used the term to translate the Greek term meaning mystery mm-hmm. uh, to the Latin Vulgate. So in the early church, Tertullian uh, identified baptism as a Christian sacrament, indicating the early church interpreted the sacraments politically. They were oath taking pledges of loyalty to the new order. It's a very public thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I know in Ukraine. Uh, they baptize typically once a year. Mm-hmm. And people who are baptized go through a year of discipleship first. And part of it is, you know, to show, did they learn, is this a, are they just kind of following something fun, or are they really choosing Christ? Uh, but it's also a statement. They And they, when they do it, it's usually outside. It's at a, a lake somewhere, a pond somewhere, and several churches gather together, and it's very public, and all those getting baptized are all wearing white, and all, so it, it is a very public statement that I claim Christ. And that's part of, of who they are. So baptism, as it says in, in 92, is a political pledge. I don't think it's hard for us to see that. I just don't have a patch that I wear. Right. That, that everyone knows what I've done, you know. Mm-hmm. This is who I am. Although some people wear crosses. <laughs> some people wear crosses, uh, but some people wear crosses for different reasons. So you have to figure out why they're wearing a cross. What, is, you know, right. what does it mean? Right. Uh, Paul connects baptism to our resurrection. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the resurrection with Christ, um, Patrick connects it also with the idea that you know in Ezekiel God made the dry bones come to life. Yeah. We can come to life. It's a beautiful picture. Mm-hmm. So he says we should think of baptism as a pledge of loyalty to a new sovereign, forming a new political community. We died our old allegiances, myself, this world, this political system, and I rise to new life. Christ is Lord. He is risen first, and I will rise again with him. You know, and, and you kind of—that's what—that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And then he calls the Lord's Supper resistance. <laughs> you know, we title it that way, and, and it was a full-fledged meal that lasted hours. So we do communion; it lasts a few minutes. Yeah, and we've done a Passover seder here, and it does mm-hmm. last hours. Mm-hmm. It was a full-fledged meal with different parts and lots of symbolism. What it was, um, it had a social and political function to it. What you were saying. Um, there were two different types of meals, he says. Suppers were shortened forms, but the expanded form of the meal included both the supper and the symposium. So that's the time of talking and sharing. And symposium was an extended meal where people would drink and engage in discussion, entertainment, lecture, 
and just kind of go through. That was a, a very Roman thing to do, mm-hmm. you know. And so, sure. so when they drew that together, they saw Christians doing a Lord's Supper, which is that meal. But then they would spend hours together talking about what? Well, the new kingdom. So to Rome, you're like, you're doing what we do, uh, but you're doing it for your politic. Right. You know, meals were political rituals, uh, historically. Uh, honoring the emperor, that's what the Romans would do. First, they would honor the em- emperor with a, a meal, and then they would participate in political action, uh, any political action. Uh, uh, it says here, definitely not any political action against the state. So they would just participate in the meal, and then they talk about how great Caesar is, and talk about how great Rome is, and you know, and so when they see us, when they saw Christians gathering for the Lord's Supper, that's how they would have seen it. Mm-hmm. It is a type of resistance in that sense. Um, so the church drinks the cup and eats the bread. They proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christians are pledging loyalty to another king at the Lord's Supper. And it's good to, to remember that. Uh, we have communion coming up soon, and it's, it's a good to remember that, that we pledge loyalty to something different. Or as I, I like to think of it is, I have faith in my future and something different than the political system, the job that I have, the what, what you know, the party that's in charge, the one that I'm voting on. Mm-hmm. I have faith above that. And this Lord's Supper reminds me of that. The place is that in a good place. Mm-hmm. So, and he mentions, just like I did, the, the Hebrew slaves preparing the Passover meal. Mm-hmm. And they ate the meal in anticipation that God was going to liberate them. So... Meal reminds the church that God provides a new way for the firstborn, a new exodus, a new redemption. And that's different. So, he calls all of that a way of subversion. We practice our faith with this political context. Yep. And it does subvert, agitate, go up against the earthly political realm that we're in. Mm-hmm. And, and we'll have trouble with that. I like that he brought Barth in at the end, who was also a contemporary of Bonhoeffer. Mm-hmm. He says, Barth argued the church's allegiance to, belongs to Jesus. And he mailed a declaration to Hitler in 1935, and he was forced to resign from his professorship uh, of Bonn, refusing to swear an oath to Hitler. And here's one of the oaths he declined. So this is something that Hitler wanted him to do, and he declined it. I swear by God, the sacred oath, that I will, under, that I will render unconditional obedience to Adolf Hitler, the Führer of the German Reich and people, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, forces, and will be ready as a brave shoulder to risk my life any time for this oath. Caesar is Lord. Right? Yeah, Caesar is that's Lord. right. Caesar is Lord. And Barth was tried for insubordination and found guilty. He subverted it. He didn't try and kill Hitler, so there's a little bit different, you know. He was but rest- he still took his stand. He did. He recognized the Christian message is deeply political. I will not take this oath. I will not do it. Um, So Christianity does not merely have implications for the public square. It it itself is a politic. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is another way, and it subverts the other regimes. He could not, I mean, I I think just by reading that, you would know Barth could not render unconditional obedience to whatever Hitler says. Because it right. could be anything. That grades against us here in the American culture, where we have right. freedom of speech. And, and, and oh, in our state, you know, live free or oh, die yeah. state. You know, right. you can, yes. <laughs> so you have that. So he says there are questions that still linger about the nature of subversion. Mm-hmm. Like, were accusations of, uh, against Paul true? Uh, why was he consistently declared innocent? It's very interesting. It is interesting. If the church is a political assembly, then why do baptism uh, and the Lord's Supper? You know, supper seem like an innocent ritual. You know, so we kind of ponder those questions. Next week we'll look at that a little bit more. So explore those in the next set, chapter, in the chapter of submission. But the idea of subversion, I think the biggest thing I get out of that is really focusing the language that even for a week, maybe you could try it for a week. I'm going to a political gathering on Sunday morning or Saturday night, depending on which service you go to. Mm-hmm. I'm going to my political gathering. We're going to sing political songs. We're gonna we're gonna make political pledges to our to our political king, and and see how that changes the way you see your faith gathering together. Right. I think, right. I think it would be uh, a good practice to do. Next time you take communion, I am t- I'm making this political statement that Christ is king. Next time you witness a baptism. Yep. 
oh, they're putting on their political badge. Yep. You know? Next time you say the Apostles' Creed, yeah. this is a political oath. I'm making an oath to who this is and, and mm-hmm. what that is, you know, and, and that's very important, you know. So I would say maybe you could practice that and do that during the week and try that. It's, it's, I'm still working through some of that. And, and remember, that's one half of two parts. So next, next week we'll look at the submission part. Right. And I know I haven't looked ahead far enough yet, but I know probably then it's how they work together. Because we live in a tension, both mm-hmm. the way of the kingdom and the way of the dove. What is subversion? What is submission? And you can't be 100% one or the other because the way of this kingdom is very different. Right. Yeah. Right. So I encourage you this week uh, to do the same. Uh, take everything you say about worship time together and change the word into political time together. Yeah, and if you put a CD on, say, I'm going to play some political songs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to listen to a political rally right now. I'm, you know, maybe you're listening to a blog. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go sit down and I'm going to have a political strategy meeting with one of my political friends and your church friends and growth group. Our growth group is getting together and we're going to have political time. Um, let it transform you a little bit so you can see really that your entire life is a politics. And I think it's useful because it reminds us that becoming a Christian is radical. It is. And we tend to poo-poo it and, yeah. you know, and especially it Especially carpet. where we live here, it, we, it, we want it, it should be comfortable. We should be okay with it. And, and it's, we, don't want to, we don't want to make any waves. We don't want to any, make any waves, but the whole point of being a Christian, even Christ says, if you follow me, the world will hate you. It's going to be radical. It's That's gonna, pretty blunt. <laughs> and so if, if you, this may help you with some of that, um, that, that all of your belief is political and also it is public. Mm-hmm. I think those are the two things, especially from this chapter. That's, it's political and it's public. So I would encourage you this week, go out and have a good political and public faith. Until then, see you next week. Bye.